There's a very strong relationship between economic growth and energy growth, um, particularly between growth of electricity demand and also of oil demand. And one of the reasons is that as the economy grows, we nearly always transport more stuff. People drive to more places, they fly to more places, more tourism, more everything. More food comes from far distant places. We're basically moving more molecules faster to more places in greater quantity. And all of this moving of molecules takes a great deal of energy, and most of that energy is oil. And this is where peak oil comes in, because the implication of peak oil is that oil prices are going to become more volatile and that the average price of oil is going to remain structurally higher than it has in decades. And if that happens, then the economic value securing this American debt structure has got to be valued downwards by some factor. Let's call it X. And, and factor X uh, is, is, the, is the thing that threatens the United States most. What happens if, especially your key energy feedstock, which is oil, what happens if that goes into decline? And it seems to many of us analyzing this that it's uh, unavoidable, the conclusion is unavoidable, that economic contraction will be the result of this. Um, I've not seen any convincing evidence that that, that will not be so. The economy is really kept afloat by the confidence of investors and consumers that uh, economic growth is going to continue. If there's a widespread perception that the economy is going to contract, people will stop taking out new loans. People will stop buying new houses. Investors will stop uh, in investing. And the consequence of that is that the economy will begin to shrink. If the economy is not continually growing, that means new loans aren't being taken out, and m new loans are the means by which the money supply expands. Money is created through the making of loans. So if more money isn't being created, that means that uh, n not enough money will exist to pay back existing loans at interest. That means there will be foreclosures, and when that happens, money effectively starts to disappear from the economy. The decline itself is not really a serious uh, crisis, but as the financial community wakes up that the growth is no longer possible, and this decline has not only started, but it's going on, it's not just a little downturn, it's a beginning of a new a age, that this could cause quite a shock. I mean, it could cause resource wars for people to try and get access to what is left. It could, I think, personally, it probably heralds the Second Great Depression that somehow they've got to wipe out just mountains of capital. Irrespective of the, of the peak itself, I think there'll be such a gap between the, uh, uh, the available supply and the desire, if you like, the, 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 the demand, that it'll, always, it'll already cause huge trouble. Now that may coincide with the peak and that may not. So that will be a, a very interesting period of time to look at in terms of public reaction. And I mean, once you start seeing gas lines, once you see um, petrol stations, gasoline stations um, running out of gasoline, once you start seeing trucks on American roads and on European roads just broken down and run out of, of, of diesel on the side of the road, not having made their deliveries, supermarket shelves going empty, once you start seeing that kind of thing, it's going to be very, very difficult for opinion leaders, for the media, for politicians, for uh, corporate executives. It's going to be very difficult for them to spin a tale which explains that um, without actually admitting that, that actually the reason is that we're, we're at peak oil and we're facing decline. <laughs>
if you're a politician in a country that matters and you say I've got a I've got a concern about oil depletion what's your next sentence what do you say after that you've, you've essentially just said the world as you know it is going to end end of you know and and that's all we have today I mean you know you really have to be able to follow up with some sense of some policy some solution because and, and because there is there really is no uh, easy solution um, at hand politicians are really loath to get into the whole notion of depletion you know you can't raise a problem unless you've got a solution at hand I mean that's kind of the rule of politics unless you're criticizing your opponent you know um, and so no one really wants to raise the notion of depletion <laughs> Of course, one would expect uh, the politicians across the world to have begun to get together uh, to talk about the implications and what each of them needs to do uh, in order to deal with this threat. I suspect the reason that doesn't happen is because the United States, the far and away the most powerful country of the world, has decided uh, that it doesn't want to uh, convene an international conference to discuss how it's going to be shared out. What they have decided to do, pretty clearly from invading Iraq uh, and trying to control oil from the Caspian Basin, which is the second largest repository of oil that is left in the world, is to try and monopolize for themselves the supply of this oil, uh, because oil is power. Without cheap oil, the American empire would never have come about, it certainly as in, in, in anything like the form that we know it. Uh, cheap oil has, has been absolutely critical to the construction of the political economy that is the United States today. And if you remove cheap oil, then that political economy has to change profoundly. The mainstream media, I think, have done uh, an abysmal job of reporting on uh, the events of 9-11, on peak oil, and other things that really impact our lives. I mean, the average person knows much more about uh, the personal habits of Brad Pitt than they know about peak oil, and what's going to affect their life, their life in, the, in, in the near future. I mean, if, if they don't have food to eat, if they don't have a job, uh, you know, that's that's something they need to know about beforehand. That's something they, they need to prepare for. And peak oil is the event of our lifetimes. It's going to dwarf anything that any of us has experienced in our, our lives up to this point. And yet we're told virtually nothing about it. Uh, same thing with 9-11. I mean, here, here was the great political event, so-called terrorist event of our lifetimes. The world has changed profoundly as a result of it. And yet there's absolutely no real investigative reporting about it in the mainstream media. Uh, instead, we have a, a, a lot of very courageous, independent investigative journalists who find it impossible to get their, their work published in the mainstream. It's a disastrous situation. <laughs> I personally believe that there is a, a deep relationship between uh, the events of 9-11 and peak oil, but it's not something I can prove. Um, there's a lot of circumstantial uh, uh, bits and pieces that, that, when you add them up together, paint a pretty persuasive picture, I think. The CIA has been, been uh, studying the phenomenon of oil peaks since the 1970s. And uh, Dick Cheney, former CEO of Halliburton, the world's uh, foremost oil services company, has, has talked about uh, the, the, the difficulty that the oil industry will have in meeting demand by the end of, of the first decade of the, of the 21st century. Now, what happened uh, uh, after 9-11? Well, of course, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan and used that occasion to build military bases throughout the region of Central Asia, which is... The, the, the new oil production region, lots of, lots of new uh, oil discoveries there in, coincidentally, 2000 to 2001.